I'm going to start. Um, I am delighted to welcome our guests and our speakers uh, to today's uh, lecture in the series on ethics in the COVID-19 pandemic, medical, social, and political issues. Um, to today's speakers will be our Shia Baig and Enrique Caballero. Uh, well, let, let me just say a few words about them. And I believe that our Shia will, will be the first speaker in the program. Well, our Shia um, he is an associate professor at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine, received her MD and her MPH from Tufts um, and completed her internal medicine residency at the University of Michigan. As a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at UCLA, um, Arshia received advanced training in health services research and community-based participatory research. Um, Arshia also was a US Fulbright scholar in Columbia, South America. Um, uh, Arshia Baig has worked on community-based participatory research projects to improve healthcare delivery to low income, uninsured Latino communities in partnership with faith-based organizations, both in Los Angeles and Chicago. Currently, she's working with community health centers across the Midwest to implement diabetes group visits. Uh, Dr. Baig is an associate director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research and is a past co-president of the Behavioral Research and Diabetes Exchange, uh, which is a professional society of 200 behavioral health researchers. Um, I'm delighted to announce that uh, Arshia Baig is currently president-elect of the Midwest Society of General Internal Medicine. That's a society uh, founded in 1978 that represents 13 Midwestern states and has well over 600 uh, physician participants um, in, in the uh, program. Um, her work is aimed at improving Latino health disparities in diabetes and in mentoring the next generation of health disparities researchers. Um, I, I didn't say at the outset that, that the overall topic, uh, both for Arshia and for Enrique, will be Latinx disparities. Uh, that's the topic today. And so Arshia, welcome. Well, let me also say a few words about Enrico Caballero. Uh, Dr. Caballero is an endocrinologist and clinical investigator, the director of Latino Diabetes Health in the Division of Endocrinology and an associate scientist in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, Enrique currently is the chair of, for Healthcare Disparities Committee of the American Diabetes Association. Um, Enrique has had a strong and long commitment to help underserved populations. He founded the Latino Diabetes Initiative at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center and the Diabetes Program within the Spanish Clinic at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, uh, but both of them, of course, affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Dr. Caballero has written numerous publications on how diabetes affects Latino Hispanic communities uh, on diabetes management and prevention, obesity, and the link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. He's also been a reviewer for multiple prestigious journals and is associate editor for diabetes research and clinical practice, the official journal of the International Diabetes Foundation. Uh, over the years, um, I'll just summarize by saying that um, Enrico Caballero has received uh, many uh, local, national, and international awards. For example, he received a special um, uh, recognition from the Dominican Republic and from the government of Mexico for his continuous effort and commitment to help underserved populations. 
Um, I could go on and on about both of our speakers today, but I'm going to turn the, the conference over to them now, and we will start with, with Dr. Arshia Beg and continue with Dr. Enrique, uh, uh, Enrique Caballero. Uh, Dr. Beg, please. Thank you so much for such a gracious introduction. Uh, I'm really so honored to be a part of this McLean series. Um, I've attended so much and now I'm speaking. I can't believe it, um, but I'm really excited to be here and I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Um, so thank you, Dr. Siegler, for the invitation to the other um, directors of the center. Uh, and I'm excited also to share this platform with Dr. Caballero, um, whom I have gotten to know in the past couple of years, uh, working on diabetes initiatives. Uh, so, um, so I have no conflicts and I would like to start off by saying thank you so much for my uh, research assistant, Sara Siddiqui, who helped me with a lot of the slides. And you will see, there's lots of maps. So um, I don't wanna to overlap too much with Dr. Caballero's talk, but you know, so why are we talking about Latinos? Well, there are many in the US. Um, right now, estimates 60 million um, and 61 million, uh, and that's out of what, 330 million of people in the US. And the expectation, the projections are that by the year 2050, about a third of the US population is going to be Latino or Hispanic. I will let Dr. Caballero talk a little bit more about the demographics and the terms of when he, he is up. Um, so why is this important in Chicago? Well, Mexican Americans and Hispanics are now actually the largest minority in Chicago. Um, so right now they make up about a third of the city's population, which is um, about 800,000 people. So, um, and that population is actually growing as well. So it's an important population here. This map um, shows where the distribution is. So where are our Hispanic Latino um, participants, you know, people in, the, in Chicago living? Well, um, so this is what we call the, the Southwest side of the city, the West side, you'll see, and you know, the Northwest side as well, and here on the South side. So um, you'll see that there are sort of dense neighborhoods, communities, um, and this is along census tracts, um, but I think it gives a good idea of the population and, and where folks are living. Most of my work has been um, around here in South London, a little village. And you know, see if you can emblazon this map in your mind, because I will be um, showing different types of maps um, as we move forward here. So um, COVID among Latinx, why is it important? You know, and I think back um, to April, uh, I was rounding on the inpatient medicine service and driving home. And on the billboards, uh, I was seeing all this COVID-19 doesn't see race. Uh, and that was when the pandemic was just starting, right? And even on my medicine service, uh, I was not on the COVID service, but we had several people who were um, you know, patients under, persons under investigation. And this was also around the time that Dr. Monica Peak, Dr. Dorian Miller were doing phone, or sorry, radio, TV interviews about this disparity we were seeing in who was getting COVID, who was getting hospitalized and, and mortality from COVID. So I started thinking, does COVID-19, it doesn't really see race? Um, and maybe it's the systems um, that see race and not necessarily the virus. So thinking back to that map of, you know, where many of the Latino um, population, where they're living, um, this map is from the Chicago Department of Public Health. And this is just to show, so there are underlying health disparities. Uh, so here, this is obesity or overweight prevalence. And you'll see, this is the neighborhood that I've been mostly doing my work in for the past decade uh, in Little Village and really high rates of obesity. Um, and you'll see it also here on the Northwest side as well and, and the, the further South side as well. So looking at, so as I was trying to figure out what was happening with COVID, I started looking at all the maps. And what I found was that as we looked at the progression, and this is what I'm gonna show you, sort of like my story as I was learning about what was happening with COVID. So this is back in April. Here we see, okay, well, who's getting tested here? And you'll see that it really varied from where you live, right? And this again is the neighborhood that I've been mostly doing my work in, Little Village. It's about 85% Mexican American, mostly immigrant, mostly Spanish speaking. Um, and then, you know, it increased, right? So by May, we're seeing more um, testing being done, but clearly there is a disparity um, that started out. 
Uh, and then even here, so this is through July, and I actually, um, I'm sort of limited by what the Chicago Department of Public Health is able to publish, but um, so I don't have data moving forward, but here they're still sort of in like this middle zone, right? Okay, so this is where testing is happening. Um, what about the percent positivity? So this is July now, um, and this dark blue, meaning that eight to 11% of the tests done were positive. And you'll see this huge disparity, right? So really high positivity rates, but as we saw before, fairly low to moderate testing rates. So what else is going on? So what about the case rate? So this is the COVID-19 case rate for 100,000 population. So again, here in April, we're seeing sort of this moderate um, a case rate, but here all of a sudden by um, May, dark blue, right? And then by July, we're sort of, um, you know, maybe seeing a little bit uh, less. This is actually through July. So looking at um, sort of cumulative numbers, and this is actually mortality, sorry. So again, more in the moderate. So what's happening? Not as much testing, maybe improving. Case rates are high. Mortality is high in this population. Uh, and you know, and I was wondering, well, what exactly is? Where are the testing sites? So from May to July, I was able to pull these maps, and you do see that you know initially a lot of the testing is happening here on the north side, um, you know, and then sparse in other areas. And then you know we do see an increase. So there was a response, right, in terms of setting up testing sites. Um, and then I was able to pull maps through November. So here, again, the percent tested is actually fairly low in the little village area. We do see here on the north side, very high rates of testing. But then looking at the positivity rates, this is pretty astounding. Um, 22 to 29% positivity rates, and this is through November. Again, I'm a little bit limited in terms of the maps that were available to me um, through January. So um, what about this second surge that we we're having? Well, this was back in October, November. Um, so if we look at who was actually um, getting, you know, having positive uh, COVID tests, I was astounded by this, um, that actually when you look at the age group of zero to 17, like, you know, 60% um, were testing positive who, who were getting tested. And these numbers are like in the 40s and 50s, you know, compared to um, the, the other populations here. Um, so really astounding to me. Um, the one thing I will say is that the Hispanic population in Chicago and probably nationally is a little bit younger than the um, average American age, let's say. Um, so I know in Little Village, the average age is actually 55. So we do, so this may reflect just who, um, who lives here in Chicago. Um, in terms of who's getting infected. So uh, this trend, again, you know, we're actually seeing back in March, April, I was hearing from community testing sites in Little Village that some of their positivity rates were 65%. So 65% of people who were getting tested were positive. Um, and then that has declined in terms of the percent positivity, but the um, Hispanic Latino population has still been well above the non-Hispanic, um, non-Latino population. And here still settling, settling in like at 20%. This was um, just based on data from January. And then looking at deaths up until November, this also is to me quite shocking. So age adjusted, um, so there's, you know, adjusting for age. So we know that Hispanics tend to be a little bit younger here in Chicago, their mortality rates. Um, I mean, the blue bar is way higher than we would want. I would say all these bars are higher than we want. Um, and again, you know, looking at the cumulative deaths, again, the 60623 Little Village area um, and the Northwest side and here the South side as well. Um, and actually the IDPH director, Dr. Zike, gave a talk just last week here at the University of Chicago and was talking about the average age of COVID-19 deaths. Um, and for Latinos, it is, you know, much younger. So, okay, so now we know what's happening in terms of testing, we know case rates, we know mortality. What's next, right? So the vaccine. Um, so are we enrolling the people that we want in our trials? Um, so in the Pfizer trial, um, of the 44,000 people enrolled, about 13% um, were Hispanic. Um, in the Moderna trial, 20%. Um, 
Now, one can say this is low, this is high, but this is sort of the fact, right? I mean, there are Hispanics, um, but does it necessarily, does a 13% reflect the population in the US? Probably not, the 20% probably, okay. Um, and then actually just a paper just published by um, researchers here, just down the hall from me, Dr. Nita Leitirapong and Dr. Bullerman and some of our preschool students, they actually looked at, well, what about the trials that are happening for COVID-19 treatments? Um, and of the 303 trials that they found that were listed in um, clinicaltrials.gov, they're recruiting potentially 90,000 patients, um, but only 17% of the, of the trials um, were going to include you know, Black patients and 14% Hispanic. Um, and this is what they estimated based on the catchment areas where the trials were happening. So, you know, um, and their conclusion was that the treatment trials are being conducted at locations that do not typically care for high proportions of Black and Hispanic patients. So what about vaccine hesitancy? That's something that we've been hearing a lot about. Um, and the Kaiser Foundation, Family Foundation, has done some surveys of Hispanics. And actually, you know, seven in 10 Hispanic adults say they'll get the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and uh, so they definitely get about 36%, probably get 35%. Now it's probably this 18% and 8% that we probably need to, to work on. Um, and hopefully making sure that the probably get won't turn to probably not get or definitely not get. Um, but, you know, again, I always talk about disaggregating the data because not all Hispanics are the same. Um, and, and I think Dr. Cabrera will get into this a little bit also, but um, when we look at the disaggregate data, so what about the younger Hispanics? What about the older Hispanics? What about the essential workers? And we do see um, a, a difference in terms of who wants to get the vaccine as soon as possible versus who's going to wait and see. Um, and, you know, I think for me, what was a uh, what most alarming was that the essential workers and the, and the younger Hispanic adults, um, you know, about 20% are saying that they'll definitely not get the vaccine. So we've talked about vaccine hesitancy. So what's actually happening in terms of vaccination um, uh, across the city? So this is data, this is a map that I um, just pulled a couple days ago. And, um, and this is actually, um, people who have received the final dose. So this is not just like getting the first vaccine, which we're, we're probably at right now since we're in 1B, but this is folks who have gotten both vaccines. Um, and we'll see again, you know, so, and I think this is something that we've seen in the news as well. So a lot of the North side folks are, are fully vaccinated. Um, whereas sort of the South side, Southwest side and Northwest side less so. And um, there was just a report out just yesterday actually um, that, um, only 17% of um, Latin, uh, of the half of Chicagoans who have gotten the vaccine are white residents. 17% are Latino, 15% are Black, and 14% are Asian. Um, so this, I'm sorry, this came out um, last week. So again, we're seeing a disparity in um, who is actually getting the vaccine. And I want to put this map up too, because, you know, when we're talking about our Mexican American immigrants, um, Hispanic, Latino immigrants who live here in the US, who live in Chicago, they're interested in what's happening in the US. And we're actually doing a fair job, let's say, in terms of getting the vaccines out um, in comparison to what's happening globally. But, um, you know, they have a lot of folks have family in Mexico, Central America, in South America. And we're actually seeing that. Um, you know, Mexico, there looks like there is some rollout of the vaccine, but in a lot of Central America and South America, not, not so much. Um, Brazil takes up a big chunk here, so does Argentina and Chile. Uh, so thinking about what folks should think about in terms of their family as well, um, and are they traveling back and forth? Mm -hmm. So what does all this mean? Um, we've seen a lot of disparities, right? Um, I always like to put this map up, and this actually comes out of the University of Illinois, Chicago, this economic hardship score that's actually based on, I think, a Rockefeller Institute um, a score. And it has these six variables. So unemployment, education, income, poverty, crowded housing, which crowded housing, I always wonder, like, that actually may mean just multi-generational homes, um, which we, we do see, um, especially in Little Village and Mexican American immigrant communities, I have seen this, um, and then dependency. And again, you know, um, 
we see where is this hardship index the highest? Well, here um, it's fairly high. So this is taking all these um, into account. Okay. So what are some of these social determinants of health? So when is sex Hispanic workers able to work from home? So that may explain, you know, why we're seeing many Latinx, um, Latino uh, workers or, you know, community members getting COVID um, just because they're out there working, right? They're getting exposed. Also, they have lower rates of access to paid leave. Um, so these are major issues. Um, also, you know, we talk about health insurance access, and if we look at aggregate, sure, um, you know, U.S. overall, only 14% lack health insurance. If you look at Hispanics overall, it's 25%. Um, but if you, again, disaggregate, you'll see actually in foreign-born Hispanics who are non-citizens, almost up to 50% don't have access to care. Now, what does that mean? There's maybe fear of getting tested. There's fear of testing positive and not knowing uh, where to get care if you need it. Um, and then, you know, talking about discrimination. So 19% of Hispanic adults said they were personally treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity when getting care for themselves or their family member in the past 12 months compared to 5%. So I think, you know, we, we've talked about this, um, the trust and mistrust in the healthcare system. Um, and when folks are getting discriminated against, um, that's not helping. So I want to say, I feel like I've shown a lot of um, negativity and I, and I want to leave with some hope, right? So here, um, I actually do not like this title of this grant of this um, figure from the Kaiser Family Foundation because to me I look at this and I know I'm sort of this eternal optimist, but this is the percent of patients say that they trust the following sources um, in providing reliable information about the vaccine. You know, and 73% to 80% of folks said that they actually trusted their doctor. You know, um, and then, you know, then we have the CDC and the public health department and it just sort of, you know, goes lower and lower. Um, but I think this is an opportunity for us um, in, in terms of counseling our patients. What else? What, what is going right in Chicago and in Illinois? So Dr. Azike is our director of um, public health in Illinois. And she and our governor have been giving us press conferences with updates on what's happening with COVID testing and vaccinations and cases and where we are in terms of mitigation. And then Dr. Zike actually gives a whole other talk, same talk in Spanish as well. So it's accessible to our Spanish speaking um, community members. Also the city of Chicago has um, a, actually a Latinx response team, uh, which is fantastic. You know, uh, I think that the city, is, the city and the state are putting efforts into uh, communicating with our uh, Latinx community members. But you will see down here, testing and contact tracing information is not shared with other government agencies such as law enforcement or immigration. And I read that and it makes me sad. It makes me sad that we have to state that, but it's important to state that because again, this fear and mistrust, you know, we have to remember that reads were still and probably you know, are still, but were happening um, and under whichever administration. What other hope do I have? That actually some private companies are stepping up, um, like Dollar General. They're actually going to pay their workers to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, this is not an ad for Dollar General, but I do think that it shows that there are creative ideas, that when people don't have paid leave, they don't have sick leave, um, that if you actually maybe give them some time to go get their vaccine um, and that, that time is paid for, that maybe we can encourage vaccination. Um, other hope. Um, so I have the Pope here who, you know, received his first dose of the coronavirus vaccine. Um, and I think that having thought leaders, these religious leaders, um, and we've seen this, you know, with all the doctors who are posting that they got their vaccines, it is influencing what uh, public perception of the vaccine. But I kind of want to focus on Dolores Castaneda. So Dolores um, was in the Tribune, um, and she's been in the Tribune several times. And she is actually a community member of Little Village. And she's been on my community advisory board for my research for the past 10 years. And she's just amazing. She knows the community. She knows what um, the barriers are to care. And this, I'm sorry, um, this line from the article, I think, sums it all up. 
So what she said, some people she speaks with have concerns about immigration status. They need to be uh, reassured that their information won't be given to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Language barriers can be a challenge, even if information is available in Spanish. Many organizations share it on social media or websites. Those are without start smartphones and computers can be at a disadvantage. Just in that one sentence, she has talked about all the issues that are impacting this community. Um, and she actually has been going around working with street vendors trying to get masks for them. Um, another story I will have about Dolores is that a few months ago, I think it was over the summer actually, um, in one of our community advisory board meetings, I was asking, well, what, what, you know, what resources can I share? What are the needs in the community? Maybe I can connect folks. And she told me, she's like, well, yeah, you know, getting masks is really important. Um, but right now, actually, a lot of families are having a hard time paying for funerals. So people need funds to finance funerals. And I think that was one of the saddest things I heard um, that, you know, we can talk about statistics, we can talk about numbers, but these are individuals, these are families um, who are losing their family members. And now they're having the financial burden of funeral costs. So um, I wanted to share that. And now she's actually working on putting together a uh, an exhibit, a, a mural really of bricks with all the names of the people who have passed due, due to COVID in the middle of the village and she's fundraising for that. So what's the story here? So high rates of positive tests, you know, and at the beginning of the pandemic, it was very high in the village, high case rates, high mortality in Hispanic communities. There's many social determinants of play uh, at play here, underlying health disparities, types of jobs, um, there's actually some data on like lack of emergency funds for Hispanics, immigration status, access to care, multi-generational families, um, fear, just that hardship score. But I want to end with that there is hope, Esperanza in Spanish. And I have this, this photo of Esperanza Health Centers and they are, um, they actually started out in Little Village and now they have like four or five sites and they take care of many Latino patients. And they actually started giving them a Moderna vaccine um, just a few weeks ago. And they were like on the news and, Mayor, and, and the Mayor Lightfoot was there and actually the, the CEO was on my community advisory board. And, you know, so there's hope that we are trying to target these communities in terms of getting vaccinations, maybe just not at the pace that we want. I'm happy to take any questions and there's just some, some questions about this vibrant neighborhood, um, this photo um, art gallery that, uh, uh, my students actually, we did a photo voice exhibit of the amazing people in this community. So thank you. Nice. Okay. Can you see my slides, uh, Arshia? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I get uh, uh, Professor Siegler. Should I just uh, go on? Okay. Yes, um, please. All right. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, activity. I really feel uh, honored to participate in this uh, program, in this series. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Siegler, for that kind introduction. And thank you uh, all in the, in the team that is making this possible. And thank you, uh, uh, Ashia for suggesting me as a speaker for this uh, activity. Um, and I just want to follow uh, what Dr. Bay has presented in terms of how uh, the Latino uh, Hispanic community is hardly hit uh, by disparities in many different areas. And I will present uh, to you my experience through the lens of diabetes. <clears throat> and that's the work that I've been doing uh, for a number of years now. And uh, it just represents uh, one of the many uh, areas uh, of chronic diseases and other issues in health uh, that are particularly affecting uh, this community and others uh, as well. I have no conflicts of interest uh, for this presentation. And uh, perhaps even though this is <clears throat> very basic, I, I would like to start with some definitions because um, there's always a little bit of confusion about this. Now, race um, uh, really emerged as a way to describe all of us based on our uh, phenotype, our physical characteristics, basically the color of our skin and many other um, features. And you can see there that traditionally we have considered ourselves either 
white, black, American Indian, uh, Asian, uh, et cetera. Now, ethnicity on the other side is really more a social cultural uh, term uh, and Hispanic or Latino is the best example because Hispanic or Latino does not represent a race. Uh, there's actually for anyone that is Hispanic or Latino to have different racial backgrounds. So you could be a white uh, Hispanic or Latino, you could be black, you could be uh, a combination of white and native Indian from the different regions in Latin America, something that we call mestizo, or any sort of combination from the racial perspective. But the ethnicity is the same. It's, uh, it's that integration in a group. Having said that, now we consider that race obviously is inseparable uh, from social characteristics. So now race is truly a social construct because it is impossible to define any of our groups nowadays without alluding to the very important social economic characteristics that are closely linked uh, to all of them. And when we talk about Hispanic or Latino, just another um, way here to clarify this, because these are two terms that are used um, uh, interchangeably, and they're very similar, but they are not identical. Hispanic refers to people that come from any country in Latin America that was conquered by Spain at some point. Uh, and that basically defines all the countries that you see in this map here, with the exception of Brazil. Brazil was a Portuguese colony, so people that live in the U.S. that are from Brazil technically are not uh, Hispanic. Now, Latino is a more inclusive term. Latino uh, is um, defining all those individuals that come from a country for whom their language derives from Latin. And that basically includes then everybody that speaks Spanish, people that speak Portuguese, in this case, people uh, in Brazil. Uh, and also you could argue people that speak French, Italian, and Romanian that are also uh, languages that derive from Latin, all the Romance languages. But of course, you will never hear someone from France saying I'm Latino or Hispanic. And that's, of course, uh, more a, a, an approach in terms of people that come from Latin America. <clears throat> now, I hope you appreciate the effort that I put in trying to put all these pictures together. Uh, and my whole goal with this, in addition for you to spend a few seconds trying to identify some of these big stars, is that all of them are Hispanic or Latino. <clears throat> Most of them live here in the US, uh, not all of them. Um, and the reason why I'm putting this is because you can appreciate that uh, we as a community are very different. We don't have a specific uh, color of skin, phenotype. Uh, the population is quite heterogeneous. And that's important, even though the culture may be very similar, there are differences, as I mentioned before, from the racial perspective. But also when you think about, for example, foods, the way we refer to foods is quite different throughout Latin America. An example is that I'm originally from Mexico. I would say uh, that a, a banana is platano. But if you are from Puerto Rico, you would say uh, guineo. If you're from Venezuela, you would say cambur. We're talking about exactly the same thing but with very different names. So language is very common. It's that basically 99% the same, but there are some differences. And there may be differences also in other aspects, but from the racial perspective, just keep that in mind <clears throat> as we talk about some of the other disparities. Now, as uh, Latinos as a group, uh, and uh, Arshi already mentioned that it's a growing population. Uh, it is expected that it will continue to grow in the next few years. Uh, and you can see here uh, some of the statistics. Um, it represents a very powerful community when it comes to purchasing power. Um, and I think that's important to consider. Now, the Mexican population, and that's what um, Dr. Vague was talking about in her experience in Chicago, uh, is the largest group, as it is in many other cities um, in the country, followed by Puerto Ricans, Salvadorians, etc. So it's a very mixed uh, group. <clears throat> now, that's in terms of the population. But I think the concerning piece is also that uh, diabetes, for example, is more common in this uh, population. You can see here some of the most recent data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. You can see here on the left the total prevalence of diabetes. And you can see that for Blacks, Asians, and Hispanic is basically twice as high 
as what you can see in the white population. Now, this is the total diabetes prevalence. It may be higher than some of the numbers that you've seen before, because this includes a glycohemoglobin A1C measures uh, to define the diagnosis or to make the diagnosis. So probably a little bit more than common, but the point is that it's much higher than what you see in the wide community. Uh, and also the rates for undiagnosed diabetes are higher. And this is important because it's not just that the, the disease is more common, uh, complications are more frequent as well. Uh, and there's reports from the Institute of Medicine, that's very important, that has, um, this report has clearly illustrated that there are disparities in the way we treat patients across uh, different um, uh, healthcare systems throughout the country, in hospitals and community centers. This is after correcting for healthcare access. And that's the concerning part, that given equal access to different communities, Blacks, Hispanics have worse outcomes than whites. And that is something that we need, of course, to discuss why that may be. I don't think that there's any intentional um, uh, harm that any healthcare provider is, of course, considering to inflict the any patient. It's exactly the opposite. Everybody is probably well intended. But I think that the system and the fact that there's structural racism uh, that is embedded in many different ways through our uh, societies and really also probably in the healthcare system as well is something that we of course need to uh, consider as one of the elements that uh, brings this point uh, as, as a major issue. Now Dr. Bay already mentioned that this community has been impacted by COVID-19 and just in one uh, slide I want to tell you that there's a very close connection between diabetes and COVID-19 in the sense that those individuals with hyperglycemia are more likely to develop severe COVID-19. Those are the people, and you've heard about that before, that many patients with diabetes um, end up in the ICU and many of them uh, die from COVID-19. And there's different pathways here. Um, now we consider that this may be part of the beta cell damage. There's the famous cytokine storm that is enhanced by hyperglycemia and the multi-organ damage that could also be related to uncontrolled diabetes. And since diabetes is more frequently uh, uncontrolled in these communities, that's a factor that may lead to this high rates of COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in its severe uh, forms. And what I wanna do through the rest of this presentation, just very quickly, is to um, um, ask you to reflect with me on, on a few things. Um, this is a slide that uh, reflects a, uh, is based on a commentary that I wrote um, a couple of years now. I was asked by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists to sort of think about why is it that we are living the best time in the history of diabetes, uh, yet most of our patients are not well controlled, and in particular those that belong to underserved communities. So we all work in a healthcare system. Uh, we are here, we're the healthcare providers. We try to guide patients on improving their self-care behaviors. We ask them to follow a better meal plan, exercise, test their uh, blood sugars, take their medications. And we are successful with many of them, of course, but not with everybody. In my sense, if you hear, uh, see here on the right-hand side, is that we as clinicians are probably very good at looking at the biomedical side of things, but we're not very good at paying attention to the social determinants of health on psychological, emotional, cultural, financial issues. And that's a struggle. And uh, my sense is that unless we learn how to do that more effectively, we're not gonna be able to have a good impact on diabetes care and on healthcare in general. And on the left-hand side here, I really love this concept of cultural humility. And that means that as we treat patients, we need to become closer to them, improve the way we communicate with them to better understand their needs, their thoughts, their ideas, and be humble about not just imposing what we think they need to do, but to work together with them in order to find ways to improve their diabetes care. And to that end, I put together um, also uh, a few years ago this list um, that is an alphabetical order, no order of importance, because I was reflecting on what are those factors that influence diabetes care 
uh, that we all in clinical practice need to consider. And this is just not for the Hispanic community. This is in general for most of our patients. And as you go through the list, you will recognize that there's many that are frequently assessed in clinical practice, but there's others that are probably not touched uh, frequently. And I just want to give you a few examples of why they are important. And all of them, by the way, have some uh, back, uh, back up in terms of scientific publications that validate that they could be important in diabetes care. Uh, I won't go through the list, but I just want to use the remainder of the time just to give you a few examples about that. From the biological part, I think it's important to remember that at least in the Hispanic community, uh, there are some biological factors to keep in mind. For example, it's been described that insulin resistance is more common, that fat accumulation, particularly in the abdominal area, visceral fat is also more common. And there may be other abnormalities. It's just that we don't really know that for sure. But clearly also the socioeconomic and cultural factors influence uh, the interplay of all these different abnormalities. Uh, something to keep in mind as we decide to treat patients with uh, diabetes. Uh, and obesity is also a common problem. And this is a study that we did a few years ago in which we basically compared overweight children that you see here in the middle column with very healthy children. To make it very quick, you know, these are overweight kids with more fat in their bodies, no diabetes. You can see here on panel A, their blood sugars are normal, uh, very similar to those uh, lean kids. But the ones uh, with uh, overweight are uh, producing more insulin to compensate for that insulin resistance. So you can see that on panel uh, B here, the higher insulin levels. But the most shocking finding was that many of these kids have abnormalities in their vascular function. So these are markers of what we call endothelial activation. So these overweight children are not healthy. We, from the cultural perspective, may think, oh, my child is strong, is eating well, you know, is well nourished, but that's not the case. These children have uh, insulin resistance, metabolic abnormalities, vascular abnormalities, and that creates a risk, not just for diabetes, but even for cardiovascular disease um, at an early um, age. And in fact, there was this publication a few years ago suggesting that for all children born around the year 2000, the lifetime risk for developing diabetes was different depending on the race and ethnicity, being the highest for the Hispanic community, almost 50%. So imagine that 50% of children born in the year 2000 are expected to develop type 2 diabetes at some point in their lifetime. Now, depression and emotional distress are very common abnormalities uh, in the Hispanic community as well, uh, very closely linked to diabetes. But we don't really address that in clinical practice, at least not uh, at the level that we should. So I have learned, for example, from some of my colleagues in this field to ask specific questions to identify whether someone may be uh, depressed, highly depressed. For example, have you lost interest in your day-to-day -day activities in the last few uh, weeks? And if the answer is yes, forget about telling them to eat better and exercise more and take more medications. That's not going to fly. We need to address some of these things. We're not responsible for fixing these issues <clears throat> that I am discussing today, but I think that we need to identify them better. And I think that's an important aspect. Now, many uh, patients in the community may have some specific fears uh, about treatments and recommendations that we give. Uh, one example is insulin therapy that we frequently use in patients with diabetes. Well, there's this bad connotation. Once you tell a patient you need to start insulin, they think that you have just read a death sentence for them. So that's the end of their lives. They're going to develop all complications. They're going to die soon. And of course, that is because we delay the introduction of insulin until, you know, a lot of years have happened and uh, have passed and people have developed complications. So that's something that we need to be proactive about to discuss openly with patients right at front. Um, group engagement, I think, is important. And uh, Dr. Bay uh, has great experience also with uh, shared medical appointments, maybe something that we could discuss later if you want. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm really uh, a big fan of this type of activity that can help patients engage in conversations. This is not a class. This is a medical visit. Uh, and uh, there's ways to do this. It requires some time before, during, and after the visit. But for the Hispanic community, 
participating in group activities is always a great opportunity. We all like to talk and share our lives and, and say uh, a few things to each other and encourage each other. So in some settings, it works well. Uh, something that I think could be considered as one of the culturally oriented strategies to provide care to this community. <clears throat> now, there's many other things that I could tell you about. Uh, language, for example, as you can imagine, is a challenge. So, of course, I can't say enough that um, that language needs to be addressed in the way we communicate with our patients, with the proper use of interpreters, for example, or sometimes if there's no other option with family members, although we know that that's always uh, tricky. But I want to share this uh, story, and, and trust me, this is a real story that happened a few years ago in Boston. Um, so this is a patient who um, uh, is, is 64 years old, and she didn't speak any English. Uh, she was treated for hypertension, and she received a prescription for lisinopril, 10 milligrams, and it was uh, signed as once uh, slash D. Um, and I am sure for those of you that speak Spanish, you immediately uh, know what happened with this patient. So she read once, which in Spanish is once, and once is 11. So she took 11 tablets of lisinopril, um, and she was rushed to the ER. Fortunately, she did not, didn't die. She could have, of course, uh, died from this uh, huge mistake. Um, and you could say, well, who would take 11 tablets? But if this is what she's reading, um, this is what she did. Um, and I think Dr. Vega already mentioned that in the Hispanic community, people trust their doctors probably more than uh, in other communities. So that's an important uh, message. It's not the right way to write a prescription to start with, um, but I think just working with pharmacies and always checking with patients. I have learned <clears throat> over the years not to let any of my patients leave the room until I hear from them in their own words what we have agreed so that uh, there's no, um, there's no uh, possibility for any mistake there. And it's just not about translating materials and being sure that they're in Spanish. We also need to think about the cultural uh, relevance for this. So a quick example is this. There's the movie Friday the 13th that you all have heard uh, before. So if I ask anyone here, well, could you translate that into Spanish? So many of you would say, of course, that's Viernes 13, that's easy. Well, but turns out that Viernes 13 does not mean anything in this community. It's actually Tuesday the 13th to the equivalent to Friday the 13th. So the proper translation would be Martes 13, not Friday, not Viernes. So very few people may know that, but when we work with this community, we need to think about just not language from the grammatical perspective, but also from the cultural perspective as well. Now, we all struggle with the nutrition part for our patients. I have to say that there's no Latino diet, by the way. When people ask me, okay, can, I, can you give me a menu for all my Latino patients? Everybody's so different. I already mentioned that it depends where they come from. So I think that working with healthcare professionals, with nutritionists, with people in the field is very important to be sure that we do the right thing with them. Now, one thing that I want to share quickly is that we did a study in which my educators went actually to the supermarket uh, with the families to guide them on what to bring home, because people may hear a lot of things in clinic about do this, do that, and then they go to the supermarket and they have no idea on what to bring home. It's confusing, it's challenging. So that worked very well. We were able to guide people on buying better uh, uh, foods, uh, higher quality foods, uh, and that worked very well. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that we need to go to the supermarket with all our patients, but perhaps the next uh, level is to guide people through cell phones, video uh, uh, conferences on what to bring home, what to have in the refrigerator, uh, and we're doing a study about that um, as we speak. <clears throat> now, perception of body image is important uh, in just a few words about this because uh, in our community, sometimes if you are slightly overweight, you may think that you are very healthy. So having an extra few pounds may be perceived as a sign of good health. Uh, and we found that also in our patients here, you see that what we found is that in our Latino community, most of our patients with diabetes selected those uh, shapes that are uh, representing people that are overweight as those are the ideal shapes. So having a few pounds uh, is a sign of good health. So something to consider also from the cultural perspective. I'm not saying that people want to be overweight intentionally, but if you happen 
to be overweight, you may not actually see that that's a problem. So something to discuss with patients. Socioeconomic is uh, very important. Um, uh, and uh, obviously this is not affecting only people at a low socioeconomic level, although uh, also in high socioeconomic uh, 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 levels, uh, the Hispanic community is quite uh, is affected significantly. So I think that's a very important consideration as well. Um, and just to finish up here from the technology perspective, uh, I think that we all have learned about telemedicine even more now because of what's going on with COVID-19. Uh, and this is done in, in diabetes a lot. You can see here uh, in a recent search that there were 2,481 articles, but if I added Latinos or Hispanics, there are only 51 in only 18 randomized clinical trials. So the work that uh, Dr. Begg and many others are doing is crucial because we need to better understand how to engage uh, our community uh, in diabetes care. So there's a lot of things, and I'm sorry that I had to go quickly because we don't have too much time, uh, but I, this is a list and I would be very happy if anyone is interested, I can share this article that was published uh, as a free publication in case anyone wants to go into more detail. So to go back to what I said before, I think this, this is the frame that at least I have in my mind. I think that we can do much better in how we guide our patients, but the healthcare system is part of the whole structure that we are embedded in. And if there is structural racism, and this is again, not just against the black community, this is in general to many of these communities. And I think that again, we can help everybody regardless of race and ethnicity, for example, whites that struggle with uh, low socioeconomic level are also people that we need to pay attention to. So this is, again, for everybody. I think that we need to do a better job in bringing people um, to us uh, in terms of the uh, socioeconomic aspects, cultural aspects, uh, and improving the assessment of social determinants of health. And I believe this is um, the second to last slide here. Just to reflect again on the COVID-19 piece, I was fortunate to lead a, an international consensus a few years ago. People from different parts of the world uh, provided their uh, thoughts and ideas. And what we concluded was that what was happening before was actually not great. We were just waiting for people to come to the hospital to see us in the clinics. Uh, we were focusing only on the acute care aspects, not doing a lot of prevention, a lot of community work. That's why, as Arshia said, what, what she's doing and others uh, are doing is, is crucial. That's really the way to go. But still, limited emphasis on social determinants of health in general. Now things are changing. We are trying new things uh, with our patients. And in the future, I hope that we just don't go back to what we were doing before. That was not working well. Let's take this as an experience and improve the way we provide the care to our patients in diabetes and in the management of chronic conditions in general. And I think that if we do that, we're gonna be at a much better place. One of the important things would be to emphasize prevention, to emphasize the management of all these chronic conditions, not just waiting for people to come to the hospital, but for people to really work with us from their homes, from their communities to improve all these different conditions. And hopefully this will help us, of course, as we move forward, hopefully not soon, but if there's another disaster, uh, I think that we will be better prepared. So in summary, I think this is a growing uh, community, a very heterogeneous group, as I mentioned before. There's many different factors that play a role here uh, in uh, helping this community. I think that we need to consider all of them. I strongly believe that we can do better in the way we communicate with these uh, patients uh, in day-to-day -day clinical activities. Uh, and ultimately, I think that uh, we all can participate one way or another from, the, um, from our different points of view, different respons uh, responsibilities uh, and, and possibilities as well to improve the care of this population as well as everybody out there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Marshall Chin uh, if he would um, uh, help um, facilitate the, uh, the questions that, that, that have arisen dur during the talks um, by, by both of our wonderful speakers. M Marshall? Thanks very much, Mark. I'm Marshall Chin, one of the associate directors of the center. And thank you, Arshia and Enrique, for two terrific talks. 
So for, for those of you who have questions, please put them into the Q&A and I'll be going through those and, and asking our panelists the questions and we'll have a discussion now. So the first question has to do with racism and, and economics. And so we look at like disparities in, in COVID care and outcomes or diabetes care and outcomes. How much if for the Latinx population is this an issue of racism versus economics and class? Are these separate issues? Are they related? Is there anything that's specific to racism as opposed to class? Uh, tough question. Can you help us start to sort this out? Arshia, do you want to go first? Or I can, I can, I can start. Um, well, obviously, I I think it's a complex issue and it's a fair question. Um, I believe that uh, it's probably a combination. Um, I, I think that when we think uh, when we talk about racism, we need to consider that uh, racism is basically any uh, thought or idea that we have, conscious or unconscious. Uh, against a particular group that is enforced by the system. So this is not just an individual thing about, okay, I just don't like this, people are don't like that. No, 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 that's not the issue. Because again, as healthcare professionals, I think that we all are well intended. But if we work in a system that does not provide equal opportunity to everybody, I think that's where the racism is taking place. Now, what does that mean? That probably not all Hispanics, not all Blacks, not all whites, of course, have opportunities. But if you look at the proportion of people in these communities that have more limited access to health care, that have additional challenges that la like language, for example, or low health literacy, low education level, and uh, not being able to navigate the system, not getting the support from the staff or people in the hospitals that don't speak the same language, that don't understand the culture, then it's not, of course, equal opportunity. So I think that's where racism comes into play. It's not a decision of an individual saying, I am going to intentionally provide better care to one person versus another. Is that we are part of a system that doesn't give equal opportunities. And I think that's where it is. And, um, but obviously, uh, I think that there's opportunities for all of us in healthcare to improve the way we do it. And as I said before, I always think about this triad of the healthcare system, the patient, and we as healthcare providers. And the system needs to improve. We need to be sure that there's uh, equity in how we do different things. We as healthcare providers all can learn more about how to help everybody, but also there are people that need an extra hand. And it just happens that there's a lot more of those people in these communities. Um, but I think that's, that's I, I think it's a combination. Arshi, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, I totally agree. Um, the one thing I would also say is that it's really hard when we lump all Hispanics together. Um, there's other um, system issues as well in terms of you know, like here working with Mexican Americans, I've been asked, well, how about we work in the Puerto Rican communities also? And I was like, yeah, great, you know, we can do that. But Puerto Ricans are US citizens. So they have different challenges than Mexican Americans um, who may have immigration challenges. So that's just one example of like what's happening in the system and, and how we're not talking about a monolith. Thank you. It's a complicated issue. My guess is that some of the future questions will uh, be related also. So, so immigration is a very complicated issue, and, and you both referred to it in, in passing. Uh, but my guess is that there's sort of a lot of, of, of us on the call that, that um, don't have near the depth of understanding of the issue as both of you and how it relates to health, health care, COVID-19, the various disparities you, you see. So what, can you give us like a primer. What, what are the basic issues regarding immigration, the legal issues, how it pertains to health, public health, uh, and like the current health and policy issues we're seeking now in terms of COVID uh, reduction and COVID disparities? 
Okay, do you want to go first? I, I think because you, you talked uh, about the legal aspect. I can talk from the uh, health uh, perspective also, but uh, if you want to start with the legal aspects. Sure. Um, so yeah, this is a big complex issue. Um, so I think it comes down to, uh, if you're a US citizen, you can have access to Medicaid, Medicare, right? Um, and you know, perhaps even the healthcare exchange. Um, so access to insurance, which in the US equates to access to healthcare, right? That's maybe not the best thing, but that's what we have. Here we're lucky in Chicago, we have the Cook County system where documentation test does not matter. So there's that. Um, I think another issue in terms of immigration is uh, multi-generational um, different documentation sets within the same family. So you may have grandparents who, um, you know, are undocumented and the parents maybe are not or are, and then the children are citizens. And that just complicates everything as well. Um, what we have seen is that there's a couple of years ago um, where access to like SNAP benefits or food benefits and such, a lot of um, parents in like the Mexican American communities were not accessing that for their children because they were afraid that if they accessed a federal or state level benefit, it would actually impact their immigration status and their children's immigration status. So that's like one direct example of how fear of access to public good when actually it didn't really matter, like working with organizations here, they're trying to let people know you can access these goods, it's not gonna impact your immigration test, but there's fear of that. So that's just one example. So I think the access to goods and services and then the multi-generational families, which is a challenge. Enrique, do you know? So I think it is, uh, it's a complex issue. I, uh, the first thing to remember is most people that come uh, are, are good people that come to work, very hard workers. They, they obviously uh, want to do better and they, they work very hard. And it would be great to find ways for uh, all these people to get uh, the, not only the respect, but the, the care that they require. And the interesting phenomenon here with immigrants is that uh, there are some data that show that in the first five years after someone comes to this country, there's usually an increase in weight and the blood pressure goes uh, up, uh, the rates for diabetes go up because uh, there's a change also in lifestyle. Uh, now people are becoming a little bit less active as they perhaps have a, a better financial uh, level and uh, they may be able to uh, buy a car. Uh, they are uh, eating probably things that are different from what they were eating in their countries of origin. Uh, so there's, uh, there's also the issue that uh, health becomes uh, worse as people come to the United States. And I think that's something that it's important to recognize that there should be probably better policies and help for immigrants uh, also in terms of education guidance in order to prevent some of these issues. In addition to the legal aspects that of course, I, I don't wanna to touch into much detail because there's a lot of political issues there, but I, I think it's important just to be sure that everybody I think uh, deserves uh, uh, right um, uh, treatment and an approach for all these different things. Great. And, and to make it concrete, so for COVID regarding both vaccination and then testing for COVID, then how does then the immigration issue then affect those two specific aspects of, of COVID care? I think people are afraid to go get tested and get care because like the CDPH website had to put up there, we will not share your information with ICE. Although I did see in the Q&A, probably if there's a warrant, they can. So I think there's just this fear of accessing testing, treatment, um, thinking that that information is going to be shared with outside bodies um, that's not related to healthcare. That's what I've seen and heard from the community. Mm -hmm. So here's a question from Russell Simons, who's one of the medical students and one of the Buxbaum scholars. And he asks uh, that you mentioned this great heterogeneity within the Hispanic and Latinx communities. And so from a medical education standpoint, well then how do you train health professional trainees regarding caring for such a diverse uh, Latinx population? And uh, Russell also asks, um, why don't we make uh, more investments in uh, the appropriate education of this type for caring for such a diverse uh, Hispanic population. 
Yeah, I, I love that. And thank you for that question and comment. Um, I believe that we all need to become uh, more involved and learn more about how to treat not just this community. Honestly, I think this is about everybody that lives in this country. Uh, I, as a Hispanic Latino physician, need to learn more about how to provide care to people from other cultures that speak other languages. I think that applies to everybody. This is the area of cross-cultural care. And I think this is an area that needs to be emphasized more. I'm happy to say that this is now part of the curriculum in some medical schools. We have that at Harvard. Uh, we have a very strong curriculum there, but it's also part of many other schools nowadays. Um, I also work in the area of professional education, and I know that in the CME world, the continuing medical education area, um, this is an example of actually this activity, is that now in order to renew your license, there's, there are several states that have made it mandatory for people to get CME credits on programs that address social, cultural aspects of care, which is great. I think this is something that we all need to embrace. So I fully support that. I think that we are moving in the right direction, but it's something that needs to happen um, uh, more, uh, more um, uh, widely. Uh, and how to train about the community and the, the Hispanic community. The first thing to say is you don't need to speak the language. I think that's very important. If you happen to speak Spanish, that's great, but that's not necessary. It's more about becoming curious about asking people about their thoughts, their ideas, and you'll find that everybody's different. Um, the language may be, as I said, similar, but there may be differences in some uh, preferences for foods, etc. That's why I was saying there's no Latino diet. You need just to discuss with people what they like to do, uh, what they prefer to do, and not to impose anything, uh, but really to come up with an agreement with the patient after uh, listening to uh, his or her thoughts and ideas. If I could just add, I think just using a patient-centered approach and cultural humility is the most important because one Mexican-American patient is going to be different from another Mexican-American patient. You don't know, you know, I, I think sometimes in terms of um, educating professionals, we tend to talk about generalizations. Oh, for Mexican-Americans, family is important. Well, you know, there are some Mexican Americans, even the work that I've done, who are alone in the US, right? They don't have family. Um, so I think that talking to the patient, what's important to you? What's your situation? What do you, you know, what language do you prefer to speak? What foods do you like? Tell me about your social support. Because even if they're from the same country, the same neighborhood, even neighbors can be very different. Thank you. So it's a question from Natalia Kosla, who's a fourth year Prisker student. And I'll paraphrase uh, uh, her, her take home point, which is that like uh, both of you have devoted your, your careers to improving Latinx health and health outcomes and reducing disparities. Uh, some health professionals, this may not be their, their passion or a priority at all. So how can we motivate help professionals to do better at, at caring for Hispanic patients and reducing these disparities? How can we align the incentives? Yeah, well, that's a, also a very important question. I would say that um, the first thing to do is for all of us to become more aware about our own um, perception of all these different um, aspects. Um, because if we believe that this is important, at an individual level, then we will be able to do more things. And I always talk to a lot of colleagues and say, very respectfully, do you think that you're providing the best care to all your patients equally? And if the answer is no, then the next question is why? Why do you think that is? And you know what? Because we do a lot of education programs, the number one answer from most clinicians is well, I have difficult patients and they just don't follow my instructions. By the way, Hispanics and Blacks never follow my recommendations. And that's when I say there's a big problem there. I don't think it's the patient only. I think it is that you have not found the way to motivate your patients. And I think that's an opportunity for all of us to learn. And it's a sensitive issue because honestly, we sometimes think that we're doing a great job and we're not. And I think that's okay. That's the humility that we're discussing today. So I think that it's really about motivating people to look at their own experience, to be honest about what they're doing, and to consider improving the care to their patients by becoming a little bit more 
um, uh, interested in this particular area. It's a work in progress. No one can say, oh, I'm perfect in managing my patients. No one is, but it's a process. It's a journey. And I think that the more people um, join in this, in this uh, endeavor, I think the better it is. Rashia? Um, that's a great question, Natalia. Um, I think that the burden lies on the physician, but also, as Enrico was saying, the system. You know, and I think if we um, push our system to be better, um, we can provide better care. Because ultimately, we want to provide the best care as physicians to our patients, right? Equitably, we want their outcomes to be better. Um, and I think that we can be change agents as well. This next question, Enrique, if you can start off with it, and then uh, Arshi, if you, if you have things to you want to add, please chime in. So there was one of your slides, Enrique, that was, uh, it had like both diabetes and COVID on it. It was like the uh, uh, biological pathway slide. And so it's a question having to do with like, um, uh, you, you define sort of, you also find like race as a social construct. And so if we think about that, that slide in particular, is there any of these like uh, uh, Hispanic disparities for for COVID and, and diabetes, which is um, has a fundamental biological underpinning, or is it really um, through the social mechanisms that we see these disparities? Yeah, that's a good question. Also, I would say that uh, one of the things that we have identified with COVID nineteen is that it also affects not just people with diabetes, but people with obesity, for example people with hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. And it also happens that insulin resistance that I mentioned before is more common in the Hispanic community uh, is a factor that leads to many of these comorbidities. So we could say that one of the reasons is also that these biological abnormalities are conducive to more of the metabolic issues that increase the risk for uh, COVID-19 severity. Um, so I think that's probably the, the part of it. The other pieces have to do more with the social aspects that we discussed before. But if we are thinking about the biological mechanisms, I think it would be uh, the, uh, the issues related to diabetes. And the fact that diabetes uh, level, the, the, the control level is actually uh, suboptimal in this community. In higher blood sugar levels, we know that correlate very well with severe disease. And uh, so I think that's the other, the other aspect there. Yeah, what I would add is that, um, and we know this in other ethnic groups, I would say, so like in South Asians, there's high rates of diabetes and South Asians get diabetes when they're normal weight, healthy weight. So um, I think there's been evidence conjecture that is also due to this abdominal um, obesity, you know, where people are carrying their fat. Um, So I think there are some biological um, differences, I guess. Um, But at the same time, diet, exercise, what are folks eating? What's the culture of physical activity? um, Those are also very important. And I I would just want to clarify for the whoever asked the question. It's not that people are more likely to get the infection because everybody has the same risk, basically. But if you get the infection, the chances of developing a severe form of COVID-19 are higher when you have all these comorbidities uh, as part of the medical background. Uh, And these are more common by far in this community. So I think that that's the correlation between this biological uh, pathophysiological abnormalities in the risk for severe infection. And this is not unique to COVID-19. We know that with many other complications as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, a couple of questions get to the issue of culture. And, and it's a, uh, a term that when we hear it, we nod our heads and we, we say, well, you know, we, we sort of get it. Um, but then you get more specific, then it gets a little harder to put your finger on what it means. You, you talked about some um, very sort of structural uh, pathways. So things like access to insurance, um, or um, access to the healthcare system, for example. Um, culture, what does that mean in practice then for something like uh, COVID care or vaccination or um, diabetes care? I mean, so when you say culture, what, what does that really mean? 
Well, I would say that culture encompasses a lot of the things that we discuss in terms of health, beliefs, ideas, thoughts, feelings about anything around you. So I know it is not a very concrete uh, definition and term, but I would say that encompasses a lot of the perceptions that people have towards the exterior world, so to speak. And that basically influences everything. But it includes language, for example, myths, misconceptions. As Arshia was saying, if people in the culture or in the Hispanic culture believe that you cannot trust a physician or a healthcare provider or someone that is telling you, that's an example of how your culture is affecting your decisions. So it's a complex um, element, and I, I don't think that we can define it with one or two measures. I think it is basically a broad term that includes all the different thoughts and feelings that people have um, about uh, everything that is happening um, in, in, in the world. And, and we share that because we grow in similar places with similar ideas, with some of the um, um, uh, sort of judgmental approaches that we have about a lot of different things. And uh, so it's part of, it's part of us. Yeah, that's a great question. And I was thinking even culture within the same family differs, like looking at that slide of who trusts their physicians, the younger folks were less trusting of a little bit less than the older, you know, Hispanics. Um, so where are people getting their messaging? Uh, I think that even within a family is actually really important. You know, I put the photo up of the Pope getting his vaccination. That speaks to some people, but it may not speak to other people within the community. Um, and, and those are cultural differences, even within this, the same culture, let's say, the same population. <laughs> I'm going to take a question from Mary Rich and then translate it to the COVID topic. And so, um, Enrique, you said a little bit earlier that, well, you know, you, you don't have to speak Spanish, that, you know, like, uh, you know, that everyone has a role and can, and can do well in taking care of uh, uh, Spanish-speaking patients or in Latinx patients. So the question is that um, if you're thinking about, like, uh, the COVID disparities and um, something like vaccine hesitancy and people are saying, well, you know, we need to find the right messengers and we need to culturally tailor the messages and all. Um, so this issue of like, well, you know, what's the ideal in terms of like, you know, personnel and messaging? And what do you do if you don't have the ideal? So for example, if you, if you don't have um, Spanish speaking staff, if you don't have culturally congruent folks, um, what do you do then in a, in a situation where you may not have like, you know, the, the perfect you know, set of resources? Of course, that's a challenge, but I think it's a fair question because that may be happening in many different settings. Um, I would say the first thing is to have a very honest conversations with um, a few patients, at least, and get a sense of why they are reluctant. Why, why are they so hesitant about getting the vaccine? Sometimes it is because it's an injection, sometimes because there was a bad prior experience and uh, it was just uh, one single episode that happened to someone. Uh, it may, there may be other fears. There may be the components of the vaccine. So many different things that can happen, but understanding what's going on would be important. And then try to work with uh, a few of those patients because one thing that I am convinced, if we find people that are champions within communities uh, and they could do peer-to-peer -peer education, that's a very powerful way. So they may not be able to really hear everything that the doctor says, but if there's a peer, so another person from the community that says, listen, I was like you, I was very hesitant. I didn't think about getting the vaccine because I didn't trust, but now I am actually happy that I did it because I learned more about it, et cetera. That may be a more powerful message than anything that we can say. I've seen that many times with many of my patients, uh, not in the COVID-19 specifically, but uh, with insulin injections. I tried to convince a patient for two years of taking an injection and he took one of those group medical visits uh, in which uh, all of them uh, had uh, treatment with insulin and they were the ones that convinced my patient, something that I was not able to do. So I think that uh, that's something to try, but it starts by getting to know the problem a little bit more uh, and then trying to find people that could help that healthcare professional become uh, spokesperson for for this. Um, 
I'll, I'll put a plug in for community health workers also, you know, so peers, community health workers. And, and I would also push back and say, well, why don't we have Spanish language interpretation? Why don't we have signage in Spanish? Why don't we have providers, um, you know, get training on how to use a phone interpreter? And, you know, again, this gets at the systems change. So um, I got a, a questioner who want, who's building upon Russell Simons and Natalia Kosla's question having to do with, well, why don't we do more and why don't we align the incentives and how can we motivate folks? And the questioner is basically saying, well, you know, thank you for your answer, but um, we want your best shot in terms of like, what, what, what's, what's the pitch you make or argument you make to be as convincing as possible about why uh, we should care about uh, Latinx health and and um, devote more resources and and um, uh, create more support incentives for people to to do work in this area for the patients. Well, my best shot is honestly to to work with people and try to help them become aware of their own situation. I mean, I, for example, have fully embraced a lot of the trainings that are going on now about. Uh, hidden biases, for example, that we don't think that we have, but we do. We all do. Whether we like it or not, we all have biases in, in the way we approach different things. So if we can engage people in that type of process in becoming a little bit more aware about who they are, what they do, and how they're truly helping or not helping their patients fully. I think that's the best way to go. I mean, I would love to say, well, let's pay people more. Let's align incentives. Let's be sure that people are recognized for their work. That would be great, but that's not going to be sustainable. It needs to come from within. Uh, and the idea that we all want to be better people, better individuals, probably uh, also more honest and responsible in how we provide care to others. And if we embrace that, I think that's the only way in which we can we can do it. It's also, also the right thing to do for sure, but I don't think that everybody uh, recognizes that that's an important thing to do. So I think that's that's where I would probably put all my <laughs> all my efforts. All right. Thank you. And Arshia, you, your best argument? Well, you're probably going to take care of some Latino patients in your lifetime. That's what I'm going to say. You know, the population's growing, just like with diabetes. I can't even think of a subspecialist who's never gonna see a patient with diabetes. And I can't think of a doctor who's never gonna see a Hispanic, Latin, immigrant patient. Um, that's what I would say. Okay. And, and Marshall, I would just also say this, uh, of course we're discussing Latinos uh, right now, but this is in general. I mean, I think that we all need to recognize that we're not doing a great job in helping everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, this is about doing a better job as healthcare providers. And if you're not motivated to do a better job with your patients, then I probably this is the wrong profession because <laughs> I think that we all need to do better. And I think that we need to be humble enough to recognize that we are constantly learning. And this is an area that I think is going to help us just be better as individuals and as professionals. So we got a question from, from Bill McDade, who uh, is an anesthesiologist, uh, Prisker grad, and he currently is the Chief Diversity Officer for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical <laughs> Education, so a, a real national leader in this area. So Bill asks, African Americans reluctantly venture from their neighborhoods to seek care. Training physicians who will more likely serve embedded in the communities where people live is important. Is this true for Latinx communities as well? How might we address increasing service through expanding opportunities for individuals from the community? That's a great, that's a great point. And I will say in my personal experience, we didn't share that uh, at the beginning, but I worked at the Jaws and Diabetes Center, a highly academic institution. Uh, I created a Latino initiative there. I was waiting for people to come to us and it worked well. In this new phase in my career, I have decided to embed myself in the community. So now I actually provide care at a community health center in the Brigham system. And that's the reason why I transferred to the Brigham, a much bigger system with healthcare centers. And I said, I wanna be part of the effort in the community. And so I am now seeing patients there. We're working with community workers, with social workers, with people in the trenches, so to speak, 
Now, not all people are interested in doing that, but I think that we need to find ways to motivate people to do that, to work in teams, to provide more support uh, in primary care. That's where most of the action needs to happen anyway. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a work in progress. I, I, I totally applaud that and that comment because that's the same thing that we need to do, not just for the Black community, for the Latinx community and for all the different communities. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's a great question. And I think, you know, what I see happening in Little Village, like you cannot as a provider get work in a community health center or even in, um, in the clinics there, you have to be bilingual English Spanish. So when you have that criteria, all the providers at Esperanza have to be bilingual. People from the community are going to go there because they know that they'll be provided care in the language maybe that they're most comfortable in. Um, But given that, I think if you provide an environment that is welcoming, um, that's key also. So in the work that I do with Little, Little Village, yeah, a lot of people are going to local clinics, right? I mean, there may be challenges outside of language barrier, they may just know other people who get care, right? Like word of mouth, but also transportation is an issue. But I actually found a lot of parents were coming up to me saying, oh yeah, you know, my um, niece, my nephew, my daughter, they get care at Comer at the University of Chicago. And I'm thinking, wow, that's really far. That's not even our catchment area. But they had all this praise for Comer. Um, So Clearly, you know, Coma is welcoming um, to these patients as well, to our, you know, um, Mexican American patients from South Lawndale. Um, and so I think that if you provide good care and a lot of it is word of mouth, um, people will come. Well, thank you so much, Arshia and Enrique, for a great session. You used the full 30 minutes of discussion. This is the questions that came coming in and you know, great talks and very thoughtful answers and discussions on some very important issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you for for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Siegler. Thank you. Thank you so much. It it was a wonderful, wonderful series of talks and uh, wonderful questions and answers. Um, I'm struck. um, I'm I'm struck by the uh, underrepresentation of Hispanics in the diabetes world and. what Arshia said about uh, only 17% of Latinos getting vaccines um, in Chicago. Um, I, next week, let me just say a quick word uh, that Ruth Faden, who is the um, 